my name is Jake. Uh, this is my first new post. Um, I've been designing for about 15 years. I've lived in San Francisco. Um, let's see, I, yeah, I've been designing previously mostly, um, like, we created the Parlor Labs line, if you guys have heard of, like, American Hamlet, um, or Argentine or Snow White. Um, we also worked on the Golden Cobra contest. So, um, this is just some of the practical patterns that I found out in the course of working on LARPs. And um, I've heard one, one of the themes I've heard over the course of the conference is more practical content. So this is a very, very practical workshop. Um, it will be about maybe half of me talking and half of you doing things. So I'd love to start out just by getting a sense of who's in the room. Um, so being as I'm totally new here, I have no idea who any of you are, uh, including if any of you are secretly super famous, or <coughs> secretly universally hated, or secretly Finnish, or any of that, like, I don't know any of that. Um, so, I'd love to have a sense of, like, who has designed at least one LARP? Okay, this is, like, literally everyone. That's cool. All right, who's currently, who has a game you're currently working on? Who has a game you're currently working on? Okay, so most people, and if you don't, then we can do this workshop on the game you've already done, especially if you plan to kind of go back and fidget with it later. Um, and one thing that I will say is that um, I do talk fast, even for Americans. <laughs> So, and especially in the back, um, if I'm talking too fast or if you can't hear me, just like wave at me, you know, and I'll repeat it. Um, I also will use a bunch of terms um, from American Life, so I don't know, again, if you need me to define a term, then wave at me or just shout and I'll define the term. Cool. Um, so the basic gist of, oh, the last thing I'll qualify is that I'm not a psychologist. Um, so I and I so the neuroscience behind this is very like normal person. Um, I'm a product designer in my day job, so uh, that's kind of where a lot of this comes from. Cool. So we're going to kind of talk about two things, um, and it starts with this. It starts with the idea that when we create something, there's the content, and then there's the kind of system or the structure. And so this is going to be a bunch of tactical examples for things you can do to structure. Um, and specifically today, we're going to talk about two categories of things. Um, the first one is what I call resources, and the second one will be patterns. And for me, everything starts with resources because we have th four things that I think of as most limited resources when you design a game. And when we design a game, we like to think, oh, you know, I'm going to put in these characters, I have this great idea, you know, I have like a premise, I have this plot, I have this like experience I want people to have. Um, but for me, like the building blocks of a game are really the most limited resources that we have to work with. And then everything else is stuff that we can add to tack onto that. So the four most limited resources are time, space, player energy, and player cognitive processing. Come on in, grab the last one of the worksheet, and a spot at the table, at a table, <coughs> or not. Um, and the, so time and space are pretty straightforward. Um, I'm actually not going to touch on time, because plotting out a game in time, I think, is one of the things that we're more advanced at doing. Space I'll touch on a little bit, and that's you know literally how we arrange our behavior in our space affects um, how we actually act, right? So like the vast majority of our behavior and our reasoning is subconscious because, and a lot of that is influenced by space. So when you guys came in here, nobody likes sat on the table. And nobody came up here and started giving a talk. You know, nobody like started dancing like, you know, over on the chairs and so on. And that's kind of because there's, you came in and there's a kind of like a classroom setting and there's like a logic of the space that you had this expectation, right? Um, so the kind of the way that we use space is that it is the single thing that is completely shared between all of the players. And if you ever play like a tabletop game, with the exception of theatrical arts, like, or you know, in theater, right, there's one camera, and everybody sees what the camera sees. So anything that anyone adds gets added to that same collective camera narrative, and that makes coordinating with each other really easy. In LARP, we don't, oh, we don't have that advantage. We have a zillion floating cameras because each player's train of experience is different. So there's like a little camera sitting on the shoulder of each player, right? And there's, they're all like unique plots. 
So how do we get everybody to talk to each other and play the same game? Right? And so we have, what we end up having is that the operating system that we're running the LARP on is, um, let me actually draw this. So it's like a lot of people and their brains. And then they're like all connected. And it's kind of like a system and they talk to each other. Right? And like this is literally like the operating system that we're running our content on. So the physical space is like the only thing that we all actually get to see and have in common. And then everything else we have different interpretations of. Which gets to the next most limited resource, um, which is player, which one should I get <coughs> Let's do player competent processing. Um, so player competent processing is literally, if you're running your LARP on this extremely ugly drawn system of player brains <coughs> talking to each other, then everything that happens has to go through a player's brain. So there's certain things about the way that our minds work. Um, one of them is that we have a limited working memory. So if you have a lot to keep track of, that you're going to be using your working memory in order to like run and process all of that. Um, and then some studies have shown like by certain metrics, your average person's working memory has about four to or it has about, yeah, four to six, five to seven spots in it, like registers to keep track of in your working memory. And I think they've revised that down a little bit because that study was done on like college students who practice up their working memory. Um, so in practice, you're talking maybe what, like three, four to five items that you can keep track of. Um, so there's this exercise you can do. Um, actually, that only works in American because phone numbers. But it's kind of like this. It's like if I recite off 10 random one digit numbers, then you're actually going to have a really hard time reciting them back to me. But if I group them like a 10 digit phone number, then people are able to recite them back. Um, and what happens with our working memory is that if we start adding content that's outside of our four to six ish registers that we've got, then we'll start clustering and grouping them so that we do end up having a smaller number of categories. So when you're designing our game, this means a few things. Um, first, it means that you're, you only get like four things for your players to keep track of. So if you have a massive character sheet and a lot of information and like massive relationships, you kind of have to pick what the most important four things are. The other, and if you don't do that, then the players will drop stuff out of their memory. So, and if you don't pick what, they, what you want them to drop, they will pick on their own and then you will not be able to control what they drop. And moreover, different players will drop different things. Right? The other part of this is that if you don't cluster it for them, they will cluster it for you. So if you don't tell them how you want them to subcategorize their information, um, then they will end up drawing associations that you may or may not care about and simplify in their own way. So in other words, players will simplify if you make it complicated. So you should decide how you're going to simplify. So the first really easy exercise is, shoot, they removed this giant pile of pads from this room. Could you help me grab like a ton of paper pads? Oh, they're great. Okay, cool. Um, so you can use the back of your worksheet or just use a, new, a fresh sheet of paper that's going around. Um, and you're going to divide it like this. Um, so over the course of this workshop, oh, we covered this. So you're going to work on uh, a game that you're already working or one that you've done in the past. Um, and if neither of these apply to you, pick a game that you played that you think you can do a better job than the writer on. Because we're all kind of like that. Okay, so you've got a piece of paper, so like cut it kind of like here, or like fold it from here and draw that or whatever. Um, and then literally all I want you to do is list off one, two, three, four, the four things you want them to keep track of, or the four major clusters you want them to track. Um, and if you and you don't get to cheat on this, so like, um, if this person, like you can't have like the identity of the other 30 characters and all of their title, ranks and titles. Like that is not one thing, that is 30 things. Um, yes? And there are people for things we should? You should write down the four things in your game that you want a player to keep track of. And I also realize, especially for larger games, that this is going to be really different for each player or each subset of players. Um, so, when I do this, like I can actually like do this separately when I'm doing character sheets. 
But for the purposes of this exercise, since that'll take us hours, pick like a prototypical character or a prototypical type of character, or approximately like every year. Yeah. yeah that was the question. question. Yeah. Is uh, generic thing from one game or thing from characters? What one character to remember? You, yeah, you should definitely pick a specific game. And you can pick a specific character or a specific prototypical type of character. Or some, some games that works for everybody in general. Like I ran a really depressing game, and, you know, so something I really want to keep track of is what they're upset about. Like everybody has to know what they're upset about and who they care about and stuff like that. So I'll just give you guys a couple minutes to list off those four things. You're going to start out like remembering four things, right? And then after you've learned it for a while, you kind of don't have to work on remembering it anymore. So if I want something like, um, you know, like the, who they who they care about, that's not going to change probably. So at some point it will become free to remember. Um, but if I want them to like keep track of like what they're upset about, um, then that that might change. So then that doesn't or sorry. So this becomes free, um, and then this still becomes what they're upset about. And then you might get a few empty slots as a result later down. So you, not everyone has to do this. This is just like if you have spare time, you can fill this out now, or you can just think about it for later. Because not every game will parse by time. But if you like, have, you guys have about three more minutes. So if you want to just take, do that, you can. Yeah. Okay. So this is an excellent point: the general versus specific point. And the answer is it's actually not that big of a deal. Um, and if you're really asking yourself the question, then all you can do is role play yourself reading in the past. Like taking a character, being like, you know, is this something that I can keep track of with like one part of my mind, or is this something that would take a ton of attention for me? The point of this exercise, like, like the, the entire point of short-term memory, short-term memory is kind of fuzzy anyway, right? Like this is far from a hard and fast rule neurologically. It's more just a rule of thumb of do I have too much stuff for people to keep track of or not, and making yourself prioritize. Yeah, so it's kind of, it'll totally vary based on, you know, the pre-studying of your players and kind of how, like, how much attention you want them to be spending on this and stuff. Um, the other point that you made that I thought was completely fantastic um, is the idea that one of their memory, uh, one of their attention registers is going to have to be spent on space. And that's absolutely true because what happens it, with our, with the way we mentally process is that everything we have to do exhausts the same set of cognitive processing resources. Um, and actually, this is one of the reasons I hate running in conference, in hotel conference rooms, is because if there is a visual barrier somewhere that is not actually like real in the real world, and you put tape on the ground to denote that it's a different room, like that doesn't actually, it's not a different room. So every time I look that way, I have to spend my cognitive resources remembering to block off what I see. Right, so if you were, but if I have a little bit of a physical barrier here, even if it's not like a complete wall, then I can see and that makes it easier for me to do it. So that's why I, I like, in hotels, I'll take uh, conference tables and then I'll prop the tables up and fold them so that they're like standing vertical, like in folded form, and then like put crepe over them and stuff, or like put tablecloths between them so that like, you know, I'll take two of these and hang a tablecloth so that they're creating visual, vertical visual barriers so that I get my other register. People don't have to like use their brain to process the environment. Um, another thing that's terrible about hotels is that the carpets are really busy. So if you're running a really stark game, like this carpet is actually not so bad, but they're like really colorful carpets, at least in American hotels. Um, and like the fact that you have to visually process around uh, the carpets is just like, is super distracting, right? Um, and also that means if I'm running in like a home or another sort of menu with a lot of stuff, like for example, if I were running in this room and there's a stack of chairs over there, I would take tablecloths and pile it over the chairs because the more my eyes have to spend effort parsing the physical environment, the more my brain has to spend energy doing that. Um, so like when I run games, I'll cover everything in tablecloths because every hotel, or at least apparently not this one, I asked, um, we'll give you lots of tablecloths and sheets for free. Yeah, right. Whereas, like, some people are like super non, are are super good at blocking out visual, but are super sensitive, sensory to auditory. Um, so, like, a little bit of auditory bleed is going to make a big deal for them. I'm not auditory, which is why my first examples are visual. Um, but that's actually another reason I love I love tablecloths because they do create sound barriers as well, like really small sound barriers. But what happens is the more people you have, the more you really need your lowest common denominator, right? You have to like adjusted for the 
for, for, yeah, for the most easily stressed people. <coughs> um, let me check my notes to see if there's anything else I wanted to mention about cognitive resources. a little more in terms of patterns. Um, all right, so the next thing that I want to talk about um, is player energy. And this is a sort of general term, um, but essentially it goes like this. So who's, was anyone at the aesthetics talk at the, on the first day of the aesthetic work? Okay, so one of the things that got mentioned um, is that actually like when you immerse in a game, you don't immerse and then like stay immersed. Right, like in practice, we tend to go like this in our immersion. Um, and this is because we, different types of gameplay take different amounts of energy. So there are a lot of different types of player energy that we can talk about, and that's listed along the bottom of your sheet. Um, there's literally physical energy. There's also like social energy, right, like as a person, you know, socializing, am I ready to talk to you, you know, I'm like hanging out, socializing with all y'all, I'm keeping on a really big social bubble right now, socializing, talking to all y'all, um, whereas like, you know, if you're an introvert, you have less social energy, you might get tired more easily, especially if you're talking to large groups, and if you're an introverted player playing an extroverted character, that's going to be really exhausting, right? Um, another type of energy might be emotional energy, like, you know, I'm like super moved by these events and I feel like great loyalty to my duke and like I'm super torn that my brother is leaving me. Um, but like how long can I feel like super moved before I'm really just tired and just kind of want to be like mildly moved sitting in a corner eating some food already? And the answer to that is about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and it'll obviously vary a lot by person and by energy type. Um, but very approximately, uh, one thing that I uh, that we found is that if you that I, I kind of divide energy into like three types, which is fast burn, slow burn, and recovery. So your fast burn uh, physical energy would be like running or moving or doing something high energetic, right? Your slow burn might be like walking along and you're recovering or you're resting. That's pretty straightforward. Um, but if you're doing something like social energy, uh, your fast burn social might be giving. Uh, performing or doing something like really high energy and kind of audience enhancing or addressing a crowd. Um, have you guys, let's see, problem is like I don't have the same suite of LARPs that everyone has heard of. Um, do you guys know about the upgrade? It's like a, it's like a con social, what do you call it? It's like a reality show about dating LARP. Um, so everybody's playing contestants in a reality show and there's a center stage and only a few people are on stage at a time and doing and performing a play, right? So in that case, like, when you're on stage, you're on. Like, your performative energy is being used and your social energy is kind of being used too. Um, so that's like fast burn. Or like emotionally, if I'm having a really dramatic scene, that's fast burn. So people can't really keep up fast burn for more than like 15 minutes at a time, on a vague without average. Um, and then slow burn is like, you know, I'm having some feelings and maybe like talking to a person, and it's a serious scene, but it's not like, like, I can keep this up for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. And then recovery is like, I'm doing the thing that gives me more of that energy. Um, so socially, it might be not talking to anyone, or it might be having like a chill one-on-one -on -one conversation. If you're talking about performative energy, um, your recovery might just be like not being on stage for a while. Whereas, you know, your slow burn might be like, yeah, doing a kind of repeating actions that you've already got, right? Like, so if you're playing a character that's very stylized, a very quirky person, and they're like pontificating and you know doing a, a, a lot of like characteristic to them actions, that's fast burn. But if they're just like repeating habits that you've picked up as that character, that's probably slow burn. And then at some point, you're just like not performing anymore. Um, so at the beginning of games, like players will, are not good at ma managing their own energy. Um, what, what they will do is they will come in probably at slow burn um, and then at their first opportunity to fast burn, they will fast burn and then at some point they will be forced to stop and drop back into slow burn and then a few hours in they will be tired and they will start operating between the leg recovery and tired until a big plot event happens that forces them into fast burn. 
And if they are dealing with other players or other characters that are burning higher, it will encourage them to burn higher. Also, a ton of other things affects energy burn, like you know the temperature of the room and all the stuff that we'll talk about later. Um, but like the point is that um, that because players will not measure manage their own energy, that means that if you do not manage their energy, um, then you will run into the situation where the climax of your plot has happened and everyone is exhausted. In fact, the middle of your plot will happen and everyone will already be exhausted. So. Uh, what can we do about this? Um, in practice, you really can't control what each person's individual arc would be. But what we can do is make sure that there is meaningful content in our game for the players can do to engage with and moreover to advance the game at each level of energy burn. I'm going to say that again because that's super important. Make sure you have plenty of content for each type, major type of content you care about in the game. Um, such that the players have plenty of stuff to do to advance their progress and enjoyment of the game, and also literally your plot progress in the game, at each level of energy. So that way they don't feel like they have to be in fast burn in order to get anything done. And make it available to them early. Yes? Uh, do you have an estimate, uh, or you very approximate, on uh, the time needed for recovery? Uh, yes, actually, it's in the pattern language document near the end under player energy management. I don't remember what page. Um, and I think, I mean, it's somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes, I think. Um, I could be wrong, but it's way toward the end. How many countries do you have? Unfortunately, like, they only printed out five for me. Um, but we, you can get, get it online. Yeah, there we go. Um, recovery energies, yeah, for about 20 minutes before players start getting antsy and want to go back into slow burn. Um, and if you really, if you're running like a much longer term game, like one day, like a day long or something, um, I mean, obviously after they sleep, they'll refresh unless you're one of those GMs that exhausts your players in their sleep because they're sleeping in a freezing winter place and you cannot feel better afterwards. But other than that, um, like, you know, you can, like, by the time they start getting into the second half of the day, they'll tend not to be able to do fast burn anymore for more than like five minutes at a time. Um, and they'll keep starting to like supplement. So if you don't want that to happen, you may want to just like literally warn your player to like, the, and set expectations for them about like, this is going to be a marathon game. So, you know, there, there will be moments um, for, of high drama for you sprinkled throughout every three to four hours. Um, so, you know, but the, here are some things that you can do when, you're, when that's not happening so, so that you can be ready to do the high drama that you want. And I remember I was at a workshop earlier this weekend um, where one of the things that we were talking about is like, as a player, what can you do during downtime? And it was like, you know, here's some drinking games you can play, here's some other activities you can play, right? And for me, like the what do you do during downtime question, like, I was really struck because I'm like, this, I really think that that is a question that should be answered by the designer and not by the player. Like, the onus should not be on the player to figure out how they can advance their social life um, in their slow burn recovery time. Right, like, you should pre-prime pre that. Because if the players are going to be playing social drinking games with each other, there are drinking games that are more and less useful for you for them to be playing. So make sure that someone in the group has, has learned those games on their character sheet. It's like super simple, but you know, you like give it to them and they'll do it. And there's one other type of energy um, that I want to mention specifically. Um, and it's, let's see, what did I call it on this thing? Um, uh, oh, storytelling and sense making. Um, because it's, it kind of serves a unique, unique function. And the, it's, I call it SNS, storytelling and sense making. Um, so this is, a type of mental processing that you use, and it happens a lot more in theatrical games, but kind of, or it ha you use a little bit of play to lose, and it's like, what does the story need right now, and what can I meaningfully add to it? So it's more of an authorial mode, um, but it's like, you know, there's kind of new content, and how do I literally like come up with a good idea of new content to introduce to the game? Does that make sense? Um, so that is a type of mental expenditure, 
Um, and once again, like, you know, you, it can be overtasked or, or you know, under use, right? Yes? Um, if there's an overlap um, between these types of energy, so for instance, if someone's emotionally uh, using all their energy, um, or for instance, physical, that is impacts the level of energy they have in the other? Absolutely. I mean, for one thing, physical energy impacts absolutely everything, right? Um, for another one, these are my kind of heuristic subcategories that I've tended to find. And I actually, and once again, I'm mean like, in American LARP, these are the ones that I've seen cluster. Um, so based on their culture, you may have slightly different clusters. Like for example, um, social emotional can overlap quite a bit. Uh, you know, storytelling and sense making and performative can overlap quite a bit. Um, and let's see, strategic is just like, SNS and strategic can also almost overlap. Strategic is just like, if you're in a more competitive play to win, solve the puzzle type of thinking. Um, yeah, so at, at the beginning, so these are, the other thing is like not all of these energies are gonna matter. Each game is probably only gonna have two or three that really matter to it, right? That's why you don't want the same person to be responsible for making up content. Like, and making up a lot of totally new content for everyone is fast work. Um, adding little details to flesh out content is slow burn. Right, so and like you, so you don't want to put someone on making up content for more than like 10 or 15 minutes at a time. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna try this uh, with our worksheets. Um, I one thing I learned, I was actually asking for like two worksheets per person, but the more people showed up than I thought would. Um, so you can do your first draft on this, or you can do your first draft on a different one or whatever. Um, but like, so you're gonna take your game, um, and then at the bottom. You're going to circle your two to three, maybe four types of energy that are most prominent. Um, do you guys feel like you know how to do this, or do you want me to talk through an example? Example? Example. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Problem is, I don't know that. Do you guys know Ghost Court? Okay. Um, somebody really quickly, in like three sentences, describe your game to me. Volunteer. Volunteer. <laughs> All right, over here, gentlemen. Uh, a game about. Uh, uh, it's, it's a game about uh, introducing an uh, entirely, uh, entirely new culture and um, and having people play that culture and see how it evolves when it's uh, it's um, blending in with some other culture. Okay, great. So you're learning a totally new culture, yeah. right? Um, and you're playing in that culture for a while. Yeah. And it's really about experiencing that new culture and practicing it. Yeah. Great. How long does it run for? Uh, two days. Two days. Okay. And for the record, what's the player size? Uh, about 30. About 30 people. Okay, cool. So um, what is your first guess, anyone, for what type of energy that that might use? Social. Okay. Social. You agree that uh, there's a lot of socializing with people? Yeah, okay, so social is one of them. Awareness. Awareness is probably the main one for that. It's paying attention and being responsive and inputting new information and new knowledge. So awareness is probably the second one. There may not be a third one. Um, I mean, unless there's like a strong physical component or a strong like performative component or something like that. Would you say there's another one? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, okay, so it's probably those two. That sounds great. Cool. Sense making maybe? Sorry. Yeah, uh, about not so much storytelling, but sense making, since the uh, components of a different culture. That's actually awareness. Story, sense making, I mean sense making in the way of like, what people have improvised a bunch of different components, how do I make it work together in a plot, sort of sense making. So yeah. Investigation, so. Yeah, investigation is more awareness. Uh, oh. Or it depends on the, what, what type of investigation, yes. I have a question. What's yeah. the difference Okay, so the, the question was, what's the difference between performance and storytelling? Um, so, for example, if I am a character, if I'm doing like a singing contest at Yim, um, or, or like a, let's see, actually, what's a better one? Um, if I'm doing a contest for dominance, right? So two of us are kind of looking at each other and we're like kind of taking up a lot of space and like being bigger and, you know, like doing a lot of dominant things at each other while everyone in the rest of the community is watching us. Uh, that's performance, but it's not really storytelling. 
Um, whereas by contrast, like if I've already pretty much established my character and I'm just like the chief here and I'm just chilling, um, but I'm like, hey guys, the bandits are attacking us because they hated the fact that two years ago we raided their village when we didn't realize there was a village there because they are like, they made villages out of leaves and we didn't realize it was real. Um, like that, I made all of that up, so that storytelling was not informative. Yes? So, um, if that said, people are coming to workshops in my game. So, if uh, a player is playing a workshop holder, mm -hmm. uh, would that be performance or uh, storytelling? That's performance. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Do you guys want us to walk through another example together? Raise your hand if you want another example together. Okay. It sounds like we're okay. Let's do one, another one. One more volunteer uh, to describe your game. This example thing only works with volunteers. Yes. Uh, it's stand, a, stand up. Okay. It's a game called a um, uh, game about a, a French Renaissance uh, with uh, walking animals among the humans, and uh, it's uh, set in mood just like the Three Musketeers, the Golden Cardinals, and uh, and some um, very cartoon-ish setting. So that's okay. the they, they're gonna be plotting, they're gonna be uh, love, they're gonna be Okay, so I'm hearing um, it's a uh, it's a kind of comedic cartoonish setting. There's plotting, there's like politics, there's romance, there's a lot of exploration also exploration. What are they exploring? Uh, exploring the world, the setting. They're exploring the setting. Because their characters are new to the setting? Okay, so they've like shown up in this new place and they have some complicated relationships and they're working out like politics and power and how they feel about everything and maybe some magic in the school. True, true poetry, mostly poetry and uh, uh, sword fighting, just like see other developers. Okay, yeah. oh I see, it's like, and it's very swashbuckling and so on. Okay, great. So what are some energy types that we're hearing about? What was your performance? Yeah, yeah. Um, so performance could be a component or it could not. Right, it could be, but you think you want people to be out there and doing stuff. Yes. Okay, so that's one of them. Um, I would also add strategy. Politics is always a strategy one, right? Um, what else? Physical. Physical? Is there a strong physical component? Yes, it would be, but that's not a big part. We want them yeah. to just more performance than physical, actually. Yeah. That's yeah, I think physical is probably low on that one, unless it lasts like three days in the wilderness. Um, or like they're chasing each other. Hi, welcome. Hi, you're supposed to... No, I'm in the wrong room. I'm oh, that. that's cool. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. There might also be social, it sounds like. Uh, yeah. A, a lot, lot of a lot. a lot of social relationships, but probably less emotional. Yes, more than st um, a lot of storytelling also, because uh, the, the goal is to, uh, to, to uh, make some great stories together that are a kind of Romanesque thing. That could yeah. be written in a, in, a, in a book. Okay, so you're improving stories in order to like you know make stuff up, yeah, yeah. and the, to kind of create this culture. So there's probably some SNS there, um, but some of that is probably also performance. So I think your big ones are performance, social, and strategic. Did that make sense, to everybody? Does that sound good? All right. Um, so go ahead uh, and circle your top. Uh, one, two, three. She might also have had another SMS in there, so she could. Might, she might have gone up to four. Okay, cool. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the left side of your worksheet, and we're literally going to plot this out like a graph. Um, and this will be the nerdiest thing that we do, but I hope you will like it. Um, I hope. So um, it's really simple, and it goes like this. This is your time axis. It's for some reason, I didn't set it up like a normal graph. I think because of the way the page was formatted, but like really, it's like a normal graph. Like so, this is over time, um, and then this is your. Uh, so this is normally your x-axis, and this is normally your y-axis, right? And this is like high high burn, and this is low burn. Um, so what you can do is you can be like, I think you can add a dotted line here if you want for recovery, um, and but honestly, it's like not even a big deal. Um, and then you're going to take one, take, draw one line for each type of energy that you circled and plot it out over time. Uh, who's working on a multi-day game? Okay, if you're working on a multi-day game, you're going to need to draw like ma a major horizontal break for each day, because it'll probably be pretty different. 
Um, and this is super approximate. Um, and then who's working on a game that they have run previously? Okay, so this is like more than half the people, so this is what I'm measuring. Um, so you're gonna plot this out separately for games that you, for what has actually happened when you've run it in the past and what you would like to happen. Um, and I recommend that you start out with what, you, what has actually happened. Um, I'm going to run this example just with one. Uh, and I'll work on yours. What's your name, sir? Tim. Tim. All right. Um, on your game. So you're the, this is the culture, learning a new culture and then slowly starting to practice the new culture. Right? So the uh, energy usage curve of awareness is probably going to start out super high. Um, and then actually, it's probably almost li linear, like, and it'll get lower, like that, right? Like, and by the end, like, you don't have to pay attention at all. Um, if you want to be a little bit more precise, it'll probably be more like this, and then they'll get tired and, like, not pay attention by the, that afternoon, and then they'll learn a little bit, and then they'll rest. And then the next morning, they'll be like, oh, we totally had this covered, but oh, wait, there's some more stuff, and then no, we're good. Yeah? It will actually, this is another great one, it will actually be different from each character. So especially if you're running a game with 200 people. Um, so you, you can take a prototypical character or you can take a single character. Um, and in fact, the energy burn, especially if you're running like a blockbuster or something, right? Like everybody who comes in is going to be playing for different types of energy or different types of content that they want. Um, and actually we call this like the root of the character is the thing that you, the type of content that has been developed out for that character that you play in order to count as playing that character. And this is like the thing, but it matches closely with energy. So it will, it'll be different uh, for different players. In that case, like you might end up like, if you're running like Magic School or something, you might have like six things on there, right? Um, and each character's gonna have like maybe two. Um, so just take one of the character types or one of your, or if you're running a box or a one of your prototypical player types and run with them. Yeah. Um, what about the stuff that you can um, very difficultly plan about? For instance, what if people start backstabbing each other? Uh, is would, of course, cost for the person um, instigating the, the challenge or the attack of the other player would cost some, let's say, strategic and social energy? Yeah. Um, how long do you plan uh, um, for that? Because this is usually something, to some extent, outside of the control of uh, the client. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So, how would I answer that? Um, that's actually why I do generalize in the game in general, mm -hmm. rather than an individual player, because there's no way you can control exactly what an individual player's track is. Mm -hmm. um, but what will happen is that because ga games are actually complex dynamic systems, like from a cancellary point of view, right? So like, there's stuff that happens and then sometimes the overall energy level of the system is higher and somehow the over sometimes it's overall lower. So like, there are actually points in the game where probabilistically it is more likely that people attack each other. So from your point of view, there are times in which you want them to attack each other and times in which you don't, right? Um, and times in which they do, even if you didn't want them to. Um, so that's actually the point of drawing separately what they, will, what they have actually done in the past and what you would like them to do. Um, because that allows you to kind of visualize it and be like, how do I control the pacing for that? Cool. All right. Um, so this was our diagram of our, this is a probably more depth than we need uh, to start off diagram of our awareness energy burn, right? And the social energy burn is probably approximately the opposite. Oops. <coughs> uh, I'm using a different color, but you can't because they didn't give me colored pencils. All right. It's approximately at the opposite at the beginning. They're paying attention to each other. At the end, they're primarily socializing. Um, so like the vague, like this X seems, does that sound accurate? Like, so it seems like an approximate description of this game translates from people being like, what the fuck is this culture, to being yeah. like, now we're interacting in this culture. In practice, again, it's probably, it'll probably actually still start out low. It'll get slightly higher. Um, they'll rest. It'll probably be high in the evening. Um, and then, you know, in the morning, they'll be like, ready to socialize really hard. Um, and then they'll be like, at the same time, they're like, what else do we have to learn? They'll do some stuff, and, you know, it might end up being Yes. Uh, I think, um, uh, for the game I've talked about, I've tried to do this exercise and actually it doesn't work because, for me uh, because uh, it can occur at any moment, at any moment uh, a player can, can have the opportunity to do the performance he needs 
And yeah. so it's not possible for me. It's possible to have a story uh, online for events, mm -hmm. but um, it depends on each player and uh, on what they are actually going to do or not. So it will be like more cluster points, maybe more than lines for the game I'm talking about. Yeah, that's totally reasonable. Um, Yes, yeah, so I had a, I played this game called Death in Valhalla, and it was, you know, set and it was like Norse gods and stuff. Um, and then one of the mechanics in the game is that people can compete by getting on stage and like, you know, doing these like high energy performance contests with each other. And then applause would determine the winner, and the winner would get like a bonus in the main puzzle. Um, so at the very beginning, uh, in the first half of the game, there's a lot of this. Right, and then eventually everybody who was not like a super high energy person got tired. So in the latter half of the game, all like conflict resolution was done by alternative means. Um, so it's sort of so this is a game that had the expectation that um, here I'll just create a new chart for this. Uh, it had the expectation that the energy consumption would be about like this this whole time, um, but in practice it was more like this. Right, um, so it's, it takes a lot of dexterity to make this happen, but if you, do, if you really want to set out to do this, then absolutely you can set your players up to stay in, you know, be in high or low, right? So for each individual, they have, like for each person, their bird looks like this. But overall, it averages here, is what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, you guys have a couple minutes to try it out with yours, um, and you will probably want to go through a few variants, but feel free to, I mean, it's a super simple chart, you can just like use another shape paper for it. Did anyone, um, does anyone want to share what they came up with? Yeah. Um, 
And I think what you're saying is also interesting because, like, if you if you start having players, you know, doing different sorts of things, it's like, do you solve that by having the story support it, and do, or do you solve that by like having in you know player surveying and player character selection and kind of, and if you can't control that, the less you can control, the more you have to work, you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, it, uh, I also find it very difficult to plan this for the um, entire duration of the event. Well, we thought that the problem that it was very difficult for us to uh, plan for the entire duration of an event. Um, so perhaps this makes more sense to split it like for a scene. Yeah. Um, because that is less or easier to predict because it's not uh, three days right. you plan it for, but it will be, I don't know, one hour where you yeah. can plan. Like it will begin high intensity. Will drain down or relax, or for instance, they have three hours perhaps yeah. to solve this, and it will climax towards the end. Uh, so I will need a rest period right after yeah. the scene, uh, yes or no. And with those building blocks, perhaps um, because those building blocks you can usually control all an event. So right. what if you're all with that planning, then it's because of your entire planning you made a miscalculation. Yeah, um, I think that's fantastic. Like, A, I think that your level of curation is really high and the bar that you set for yourself is really high. Like, if you can actually manage design at that level, like, that's incredible, right? Um, so the reason that I was kind of able to listen to that gentleman's game um, and ballpark this just from hearing it is because, like, our bodies and just our behaviors will have these traits over time. So if you take off designer hat and put on player hat, um, and just think about how your ener overall energy has been over the course of a three-day game, then there will be approximate trends like this. Um, and so the other thing about this tool is that like it tells us where to design, right? But it doesn't tell us what to design, right? Um, so you are curating at such a high level that you're immediately deriving what to design. But there's like no way in hell that I know what's going to happen here. But what, if I draw this approximate line, I know when I'm on track and when I'm off track, and I know like kind of approximately what I want to happen. So the, this tool is not meant to solve like every detail of this level of design. It's more meant to be like, oh, I created a game that could never have achieved the thing I wanted to achieve in the first place, and it's, to like catch that level of error, right? Um, yes. I'm uh, I'm writing a festival scenario, which is a written scenario with scripted scenes, and they will be set by game masters. So at first I thought this would be difficult, but then I realized that I could use this to see if every character has something like will there be some, do they have enough to do, and and like because the, the scenes will focus on different yeah. characters, yeah. and also because we, I want the players to be able to reflect on the others' stories, which yeah. is mostly going on in here, but you will be able to see that through the scenes. So by doing this with every, like there are more characters and it's going to take like four hours. And by doing this with every character, I'll be able to see if they have time to reflect on what yeah. just happened in a, in, a, in a fast burn and, or high burn and, and have time to reflect on someone else's high burn and, like, and see that. Yeah. So yeah, it's really interesting. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, because when you have a small number of characters, you actually can do it for literally everyone. And it's nice. Yeah. Did anybody uh, discover anything interesting in contrast from their ideal and what literally happened? No? Okay. Cool. I think like half of those people left the room. But sometimes you're like, what actually happens is nothing like it. So yeah. Um, and I think some of these questions might actually be answerable by the exercise on the other side. Uh, so before we do that, I just want to do like a check-in with you guys because half of the people have left the room. Um, so I'm not sure if this is like scheduling. Like, How are you guys feeling in terms of your energy burn level? Like good, tired, like you guys. Okay, let's take a five minute water break. Does that sound good? Okay, we'll totally do like a five minute break. How are you guys feeling? Better? All right, I'm seeing a distinctly higher level of energy in the room. I totally forgot about the break. Thank you for reminding me. Especially Olaf with the pointing of the cup. That was great. <laughs> So really quick, we're going to do the exercise on the other side of the worksheet, um, and that might answer some of the questions about the content, um, the other half of the worksheet that you have not touched. Um, and okay, so brief nerdy explanation. Um, I want to make the distinction between complicated and complex. And um, so, and this is describing content. So this part is talking about 
when you are building out the content for your game, for the component of your game that pertains to that energy use type, um, how much stuff should you be putting in it? Like, how much work should you be putting in it? Um, so I'll, we call something complicated if there are a lot of things to keep track of and like a lot of moving pieces. Um, whereas like if it's simple, there's like it's straightforward, it's simple, right? So if I'm playing like one of those like space war board games where like there are like there's a book of rules and like zillions of little chits, like you know what I'm talking about? Like those games are complicated. Um, whereas like if I'm playing like a G form is an example of something that's probably on the simple side. Um, by contrast, uh, flat versus complex. So com something that is complex is something that is a complex dynamic systems in like a chaos theoretic way in which if you take an action, it has a chain reaction that moves something else, which then has a chain reaction that moves something else. And if it's flat, then you take an action, and then its reaction doesn't really change anything else going on. Um, so this is also known as like uh, whether something is critical or supercritical or subcritical. Um, but I'm not going to get into that because I'm not important. Never mind. Um, <coughs> so like something is more complex, the more steps of chain reaction it can trigger. So when you're running a game, um, you want the People, people, players uh, want their actions to be meaningful, right? Like if you do something, you want to see the, the, the fact that you did it reflected in the world around you. Like that is kind of the fundamental unit of player satisfaction, is I did something and it mattered to the game. Um, but if you can do something and have it matter too little, like it's like, oh hey, you know, I just like poured out my heart to you, but your plot is something totally different. You just don't care. Like, what am I going to do now? Like, I didn't matter, now, right? Um, or you can matter too much. I can be like, I poured out my heart to you, and then you stab the king, and the succession is resolved, and now it's over. <laughs> right? Like, another way to think about this is if we get the entire cast of Harry Potter in this room, um, then they're going to have a nice, like, three hour game before they get resolved, right? Like, even if Lord Voldemort is there, they're going to, like, look at each other and, like, people are going to talk to their own factions before they have little duels, and then finally there's going to be an after confrontation. If I put the entire cast of Star Wars in this room, it's going to be over 10 minutes flat, right? So that's, like, two chain, that, that's called super critical. Like, each chain reaction will break, it will break the entire game. Um, if I put, like, the entire cast of, I don't know, like, you know, you, okay, you can imagine, like, if I put a bunch of people in this room and, like, nothing happens after, like, <coughs> that can also happen, right? So that's subcritical. So you kind of want this juicy space in the middle. It's really, like, how juicy your plot is, um, is how complex it is. So uh, the rule of thumb that I use is that we want our game to be as complex as possible compared to how complicated it is. And ultimately, <coughs> like, more complex is better because it means that more people can take actions that have propagated consequences in the system, so more actions are meaningful without breaking the game. Mm -hmm. Right, like, in larger fractions of your things matter, but the game still remains in relative equilibrium until we're ready for it to climax and explode. Um, yes? Um, is this also a, um, a barrier uh, to entry reason? Because I can imagine that a very complicated system people um, will not do anything because they're afraid to touch all the dials and buttons. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, but whereas simple versus complicated, the compl more complicated it is, the harder it is to learn. And the more people will be deterred from trying. Yeah. It's, it's very straightforward, right? But complicated is not always bad. Sometimes like you're just running for a bunch of like military history buffs and you just want to represent things as accurately as possible and you really just want 200 factors going on and that's what, why everyone is playing your game. So that you can conceivably make the design choice to be complicated, though by default I recommend we try to keep it simple. But it never makes sense to make the design choice to be flat. Um, so as a result, we're always trying to kind of shoot toward the upper right corner. Or when I say always, I mean it's nice to be up in the upper right corner. This is for each of your circled energy types, think about where in the grid it fits in the version of your design that you currently have and in your head and where, where you want it to be. Do you guys want an example? Yes. 
Uh, everyone wants an example. Who wants to be the example? New person. If you ask for an example, you must be willing to be it. Yes. Uh, All right. We have this uh, game where it's uh, it's a camp of people that have lived together for a long time, but now mm -hmm. they're coming towards this place where some people want to leave. They're just not going to stay, and others just won't leave. They just want to remain. So it's about like the relationships and the problems that occur when resources and stuff like that have to be split. And if you can sort of keep the people together in any way. Okay, so I'm hearing you have a camp, a, like a culture of people. Um, and what's fragmenting them? Uh, basically, issues like safety, resources. And okay, so scarcity of resources, like life is tough, the environment is tough. So there are different factors. Like people disagree about what to do with their limited resources. Well, that uh, like ideological issues too. and ideological things as well. So it's probably it's somewhat political, it's somewhat social and values driven and relationships driven. Very much social emotion. Uh, social emotion, great. Yes. So what are your main energy types? Uh, the main ones were uh, emotional uh, is the very top one. Okay. Uh, social is next, and then performance. Okay, great. Okay, so it's less competitive and it's more just like we really have to work out what it all means to us guys. Yeah. Yeah, all right, cool. Emotional, social performance. Cool. Um, okay, so let's take uh, the emotional one of these, right? Because you listed that one first. Um, so how much, how, how much content is there, right? Is like, so emotional, simple content would just be like, you know, I have three people that I really care about and what's up. Emotional, complicated content would be like, I have 12 people I care about and what's up. Uh, well, on average, a player has, uh, well, the baseline was uh, one person that they really care about, two okay. that they are good friends with, two okay. that they can really deal with them okay. when they hate. So okay, and you, it can also be not people, so there's also like values or like, you know, ways of life or things that they care about. So like, yeah, like how, how, simple, how complicated are their investments? Uh, well, I would put it somewhere in the middle section. Yeah, like what you're describing sounds like it's in the middle. Cool. Um, and then let's say that I have a feeling about something, um, and then I share it with you, or I act on it, right? Like, I'm angry about what's going on. Um, actually, I'm torn about what's going on, and I, like, confess all of my issues to, to you. Um, to what extent does that then trigger some of your issues to go and make issues for other people? Well, uh, it's designed so that the characters sort of all, they all have their <coughs> own attitudes towards the split. So uh, when someone sort of comes out with an issue, probably someone else uh, takes, uh, not necessarily offense, but they are sort of, in a way, emotionally activated by another person's problem, even okay. though that's not the person that they are talking to as such. Okay, so it's like, even if, like, if someone over there has a problem and takes some actions, then I'll still be affected by their, their actions. Well, that's, I mean, that is, since it's a social game, it's, if you don't hear it, be right. about it, then it doesn't affect, but it's like... Okay, so ideally you really want it to be very chain reaction. Yeah, but it's right. like kind of small, small space yeah. camp, so it's kind of hard to keep big conflicts yeah. from not spilling over into a yeah. situation. So what you're describing to me sounds like the lighter end of complex. Like it sounds like it's not so much bouncing as one really big bounce. Well, it's supposed to be about the personal relationships more than uh, really System. Yeah. So it's all about face to face. Yeah, what you're describing to me sounds like the relationship side is high on complex and the emotional side is low is medium on the low side of high on complex. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Question, yes. Can you give like the dream example of complex? The dream example <laughs> so of complex. Mean, like, get the scaling? Like what is the what is the goal of complexity in um, can you give me an example of the answer to this question? Okay, is it like a chain of dominoes that goes all the way from the start to the end, or is it uh, is it just a how? I would say that for me, with and in terms of like how I've seen systems work, that if my actions can change three to four times before the system reaches a new equilibrium, that's pretty ideal. Um, that's like that would be like super ideal. If it changes like seven or eight times before the system reaches equilibrium, you have achieved a mathematical feat I have never seen in LARP before. Um, but I think three or four times is what I could remotely mentally picture being realistic. 
Um, if it changed like once, that's kind of like probably medium for me. Um, yeah. Does it make sense why you want it to have a chain reaction? It's because um, the, the more complex it is, the more plot and content are generated through less energy usage. Right? It means I insert one thing of emotional energy, and then like it creates this domino effect of content for a lot more people. So the system becomes much more efficient at using high burn. So, yeah, so not yeah. necessarily a chain of actions, but just the one action. It's a chain of consequences. It's a chain of meaning. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right. Let's just give this a try, because this is honestly like, this is a minor exercise. It's like not a big deal. Um, so go ahead and fill in your ideal and what's, what you think is currently going on. And not everything like is ideally in the top right because not all types of energy are equal, right? Like some things you're right, you're just fine having it be simple and maybe like a little bit flat, a little bit complex. It's like that. Did anybody get surprised? Nope. All right. Cool. Um, so interesting story. Uh, the thing that is in your most complex, that is what your game is about. Um, so if that is not what you want your game to be about, then um, you should know that. The, that will be what everyone thinks your game is about. Uh, um, and the converse of that is anything that is in the more complex or more complicated is going to take up a lot of your work as a designer to put together. Right? So if you look at your chart and you're like, I have like four things that are all going to be complex, like either you are a total genius or you have a massive amount of time, or you may want to prune it down so that you just have one or two things there. Um, and most games that are polished that I play will have like only one or two really complex things, and then everything else kind of hovers in this middle area um, to kind of be support. All right. right, you kind of have to pick what your game is about unless you're building a massive thing or unless you're writing a giant game that you know has multiple of these grids for different characters. Does anybody want to share something that they did? One person. Anyone? All right, let's, let's hear it. All right, my game has player sets. All right, my game has player set flashbacks and flash forwards. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a limited resource, uh, but um, uh, so that was easily something that I put in the complex range because you start involving other players which mm -hmm. the, and their pasts and stuff. So that was mm -hmm. that definitely. Uh, involve them, um, but how? Uh, I'm not sure how complicated it is, yeah. but I ended up in the middle. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on how you end up handling it. Yeah. Yeah, that's an S and S one, right? Uh, yeah, I got the yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, let me ask you a different question. Is anybody that like, totally confused and totally did not understand how to do this exercise or what the one was? My lane. All right. Good. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, or, and this is also a very abstract thing, so if this is not the way you think as a designer, like, just don't worry about it, right? This is just like a rule of thumb that you can do to check. I did this once and I was like, this is, like, I wrote a game that was, that had an improv component and was supposed to be about people, like, feeling really cool. I had written it to be this emotional game where you get to feel like you're really important. But the, it turned out that the SMS burden was so high um, that I looked at it and I was like, this is explains why everyone plays this game and they think it's an improv game. And I'm like, guys, it's not, it's an emotional game. But no, like, it was an improv game because the biggest, the most complicated thing was the SNS. Um, and so that became what the game is about. And whatever your biggest energy expenditure is and whatever your most complex thing is, like, that's going to be what your players remember your game for. And that's going to be what they put to you. So, that's cool. All right. Um, so we are starting to run out of time. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to just touch upon patterns, um, which is, yeah, so we, so we talked a lot about energy usage and cognitive usage and kind of how they're connected. Um, so the, the kind of, the way I think about this is like, we as humans are wired in certain ways to behave in certain ways. And when we write a game, we can either use this to our advantage or fight it and lose. So a lot of this is just to be like to be aware of what the 
player habits or the human habits around the game are so that we can construct our game toward that. Um, so the patterns half of this is these are just some hacks that you know that we found um, to that often work as specific shortcuts around this. Like you guys kind of did like the scientific version of this, um, but then there are a lot of like really specific rules of them. Um, and unfortunately this document everyone wasn't able to get a copy. Um, but it just has a couple dozen things we've had. If you go to my website, vermilion.games, you can download a copy if you want. Um, but I'll just like talk through a few of the examples on here. Um, so one of them that I really like is conversation size. So this is what is the average number of people who participates in a conversation. Um, and what ends up happening is that when you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone, there's a lot of subtlety and nuance that gets transacted, not just in language, but in, but in body language and kind of who nods when. And if I use a word, I can kind of tell by just like by our eyes how we're reacting to my usage of that word. If the more people are in that conversation, the lower the bandwidth of information that can be trans uh, that can be communicated. Because if I'm now talking to a group of like six people and we're all having a conversation, then the conversation gets kind of less deep and less subtle, right? Um, and the more people, and even if I'm talking to three people, like now it's whatever people take away from that has to be the intersection of three people. And if it becomes nine people, it's what those nine people have in common. Um, so it means that your average cluster size or your average conversation size in your game of, will affect the subtlety of the data that gets transacted in your game. I'll say that again. The fewer people talk to each other at one time, the more nuance you are able to capture, and the more nuance other people are able to respond to socially. So for example, I ran um, a really emotional, really social game called Mermaid, and it was like all about falling in love and feeling alienated, and people having really subtle feelings about like how unhappy they are, and I'm unhappy, so I made you unhappy, and it was a lot of that. Um, and it was a game rule that conversations could only be two people at a time unless you had a special ability to host a conversation with more people. But the vast majority of interactions were one-on-one, -on -one, and if you wanted to talk to someone or talk to someone else, you had to just like let them know you wanted to talk to them and then wait, just as an out-of-character rule. Um, and as a result, there were a lot of really intense like relationship interactions. Like there were like, like I think I like tripled the um, number, the, just like the volume of intense relationship interactions I was able to get with just that one rule. Um, if you're running a smaller political game, so I would say for like 40 people or less, I like a cluster size of three because I think three people is enough to plot together, but it's not enough to make those plots, like make the interpretation of those plots highly politicized. Um, so therefore like, if like a cluster size of three or four drives action, a cluster size of five, by that time it kind of becomes a bureaucracy. Um, so we can affect our cluster size in a number of ways, right? One is literally how we position furniture. People are, at least in shorter games, people are not prone to moving furniture around. Like, they'll just like stand here with one person sitting in the chair and one person awkwardly like looking at them um, without pulling up a chair from a different part of the room. So if you position your furniture to indicate the conversation sizes you want, that's cool. Um, also, how you literally like rope off space. How many people fit? Um, another thing is, if I want a conversation with like three people in it, I might do like one long couch and one short couch um, because it becomes too uncomfortable to squeeze five people like together, but then it's loose enough that like people will still occupy uh, the furniture. Um, but whereas if I put like just three chairs next to each other and no nothing but three chairs facing each other, it's kind of like really hard to right? Um, people also don't like having conversations like this when you place furniture. Like, they, you kind of want to place like on the side so that they're like talking into the space. Um, which gets to another pattern, which is social bubble size. So, um, we, we all have physical social bubbles. Right, right now my, mine is big because I'm speaking. Um, but if I can like come up to you and say like, hi, how's it going? Okay, yeah, alright, so like your social bubble is maybe about this big, mine is a little bigger. Right, and the intersection of our social bubbles is our conversation. Um, so, if, uh, so if I'm kind of trying to manage conversation groups, 
I will group furniture based on how big I want people's, or where I picture people's social bubble intersecting. So literally how far away you place chairs will affect the sort of conversations people have when they sit in those chairs. Because uh, if we are really close to each other, like, hi, um, you know, then I feel like I can like share more things with you, right? But if I'm standing here, I can still say hi, but I'm not gonna tell you about like my history with my mother. Um, but if I'm super, super close, then suddenly this is like really threatening, and I'm also not gonna talk to you about my relationship with my mother or even about my day with it. I just kinda wanna get away from you. Another example of a pattern is temperature. Um, the temperature in the room will affect your social bubble size, which will then affect the types of interactions you want. So if it's super cold, people have smaller bubbles, but they're also more resilient in bubble size. So like, if it's colder in the room, then you know, there is more reliable, right? But like, people are gonna play closer. If it's hotter, people will generally have bigger bubbles, but then they'll kind of flux in how big they, or small they are, and like, you know, I'm, and people will have like lower attention spans. A warmer room burns mental energy. Like a room that's too hot will burn mental energy, a room that's too cold will burn physical energy. So those are just like a couple examples. I'm not gonna keep talking forever because I've been talking for a long time. Um, but if you want to check out more like little patterns and hacks, there are a lot of things like that in there. Cool. So uh, with that, um, thank you guys for coming. I've got a couple more minutes if anyone wants to ask any like general questions. Cool. All right. So thank you. I really appreciate your sitting through this remarkably like classroom like setup for like an hour and a half on the third day when we're all really tired in the afternoon. So for everyone who stayed, thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to always talk about this. Um, and if you want uh, to get a copy of stuff, um, please email me. Or actually, you know what, let me, here, please give me your email, and then I will email you. That's kind of better. Um, so I'll pass this around. And give me your email really legibly, please. Um, and I'll send you like all the documentation. Yeah, you, okay, you are keeping this one? Uh, no, you guys can keep the, the printouts if you want. Take the printout. I've got an extra one if anyone wants this one. Yeah. Um, and then there's more related theory and stuff at Vermillion.games. Yay. All right, thanks guys.